Hi, Ryan. I'm here. There we go. Hey, hey, Emily. How you doing? Hi, I'm doing well, Ryan. It's nice to meet you. It's it's nice to meet you as well. I've been really looking forward to this, as you know <laughs> from my messages. I'm <laughs> genuinely who's always who's excited to talk shame, guilt, and empathy like I am. But um, yeah, I'm really excited to to talk to you. Um, let's get rolling here. Let's do this. Um, okay. I want to say, like, I, I've scrolled through your Instagram numerous times for people listening to this. Um, follow you. <laughs> I I always wait for the social pubs and website pubs till the end. I would uh -huh. love for you to pub your Instagram now because your Instagram is awesome. It is very easy to understand and is very okay. relatable to, like, everybody that's like, oh, I've dealt with this. Oh, I've had to deal with this. I remember this. And every every post you go through... It's like you, you're dealing with it. You know, someone that is dealing with it. So I love for you to uh, please share your Instagram. Sure. Well, that's nice feedback to get to. Thank you. I you're welcome. really try to make sure it's digestible and not full of therapy to speak. <laughs> it's, it's great. So what, what is your, what's the Instagram handle that people can find you? Um, it's emily.sanders.therapy. It's awesome. It's the best. Thanks. Um, I Thanks. appreciate it. And so, yeah, so it was a mix of finding your account, scrolling, being very relatable on top of listening to like Brené Brown at the same time. I'm like, wow, this is all like getting flooded uh, into my mind sure. at the same time. And then also having therapy sessions um, with my with my wife. Um, everything is great. It's one of those things where we, we chose to do um, as more of like a precaution we want to make sure. sure we handle our problems before they become problems. It's all, it's all about communication. It really is. Like, how do I receive communication and how does she, and how do we speak the same language? Um, but yeah, that's why I'm so excited to get you on this episode is because I feel like the stars are aligning for me to have a conversation <laughs> with you. Sure. Um, and like I said, your content is just awesome. So thank you so much. And Thanks, correct me if I'm right. wrong, you're joining me from California, right? Yeah. Uh huh. How yeah. is it out there right now? You're just south of LA. I'm, yeah, I'm in Orange County by the beach. And uh, yes, it's very nice <laughs> not to rub it in, but <laughs> I'm so grateful to be here. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, how do you feel around the holiday season when it's warm and it's sunny and you're at the beach? Is that okay with you? It's fine. It's fine with me. I have a brother who lives in Montana and they get start. I mean, they've got snow before Halloween. Oh, yeah. And I, I mean, I like the idea. And the fantasy of a white Christmas, but logistically, I do not want a white Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I've had plenty of those. Uh, sometimes a white Christmas, they're beautiful, but sometimes they ruin Christmas. And you can't sure. get around and people can't see each other. Um, I'm curious, we don't have to dive down this too far. Where in Montana is your brother? He's in Billings. Is this live? Are we? Is this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, why not? Right. Sure. Unless, yeah. unless you want me to cut it, sure. Yeah, I, I only ask that because. Um, I've been out there a couple of times and uh, my company that I work for Element also has headquarters in Bozeman. So I've been out there a few times, going back out again in February. It's a beautiful place. It's a ginormous state. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, beautiful place. And yeah, they pray for snow because uh, a lot of them people, a lot of the people live off of uh, skiing and tourism. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I can live out there, but who knows? <laughs> not for me, but that's okay. Visiting not for straight. everybody, not for everyone. Um, but yeah, let's talk about who you are and what you do first. Let's introduce yourself to the people. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm a psychotherapist. My licensure is marriage and family therapist. So, um, but I absolutely love what I do and I practice privately. So I'm independent and, um, but I've spent in a, a stretch of time in court mandated rehabs. So basically mm. primarily men are told you need to get sober or else you're going to prison situation. So I spent a lot of time with the homies and I loved that. And I've worked in a number of different settings, but finally landed just, you know, practicing by myself. So I see, um, a variety of, um, individual and couples, uh, some families I really don't take minors anymore because parents are a lot. Mm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I love what I do. And I've been practicing for 12 years, something like that. 13 years. I should think about that. I should know the number, but yeah, yeah. you've probably seen it all by now, especially working with 
people who are perhaps on their way to jail. How was that experience? I, I mean, I love it very much in part, I think, because it reminds me a little bit of growing up. I grew up in a very diverse area, low SES, uh, socioeconomic status area. And um, so I don't know, it just felt familiar. And I really enjoy getting to be around people that are different from me. And um, the need is so great. So the stories are painful to hear, but it mm -hmm. feels like it's work that was worthwhile. Um, so, and I, I would actually like to go back and, and do it more, maybe when mm. my children are a little older and I have more flexible time, but yeah, I really did enjoy that very much. Do you feel that process works or like, what's the percentage of actually like speaking to somebody you uh, like you or going to jail? Like, uh, does that process actually work or is it individual? Uh, it's obviously extremely individualized, right? Because therapy doesn't work if you don't want it to. Mm -hmm. So in part, that work was tiring because it's basically trying to convince people to choose differently. And, you know, if somebody's motivated and they want to learn, then guess, I mean, chances are high. It doesn't mean they're not going to relapse, but if a lot of the work is trying to help people see that things need to be different, do you mm. want your children? Do, what life do you want for yourself? That's very exhausting, trying to get people to the place where they even want to change um, because we can't force people to change. They have to want it for themselves. So mm. if people want it for themselves, then success rate is high. But but many don't. And you know, what's ironic is even in being a clinician, I have people that come and they pay me to sit with me and talk about change, but are inherently extremely resistant to it. Mm. Um, so change can take a long time. <laughs> yeah. It's um. what do you do in those situations? Right. I mean, why are they there? Is it just to say they went? If, if they I, don't really want to. Sure. I mean, it depends on the person, right? Some people are threatened to go by a spouse or whatnot. A lot, a lot of people, I, I think they say they want things to be different, but because every change brings loss with it, mm -hmm. they may want the change, but not want the loss. And so now there's a bind, right? Because it's too hard to let go of the thing to get the thing. And so then a lot of therapy becomes around what could change look like? What will it require? What loss are you facing? And so, you know, if we look at stages of change, research says there are stages of change. Pre-contemplation stage means we're not even aware that something needs to be different. Mm -hmm. It's not even in our awareness that things need to shift. But then we have contemplation stage where we start kicking around the idea that maybe we would want things to be different or what could it look like? And maybe we start to fantasize about um, what needs to be different. And then we have a practicing stage. And so maybe we try to implement things, um, but we might kind of go backwards and just stop giving it a shot and go back to thinking about it. And then we have a period where it sticks, right? Mm -hmm. So even in a lot of relationships, because a lot of people come in to talk about, do I continue this relationship or not? Um, how do I handle my family? Do I still want this marriage? How do I handle my adult child, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a lot of practice that comes with finally being able to leave or finally being able to speak up. So it's just messy work. <laughs> I imagine you deal with people in all of those stages, right? Do you have do. to be in that final stage for it to work or can it ever work by force? I guess, if you will. I, I don't see anything working by force. Yeah. Not, not authentically. Yeah. So yeah, it is interesting to me how oftentimes people will say, oh, I just, I got impulsive and I made this change. Mm. And, or I, I was impulsive and I bought this thing. But a lot of times if we sit with it, it's something they've been thinking about for a long time or daydreaming about for a long time or reading about for a long time. And then all of a sudden they get the swell and they, 
they pull the plug. So it's not actually as impulsive as, as people think. Makes sense. And yeah. this wasn't a question on the um, itinerary here, but uh, I want to ask you, do people change? What What is your thought process when someone asks you that question? Well, I think I've changed a lot over the years. I, change is very much a thing. Um, but there are many people who do not change. In general, our growth is and has so much to do with emotional flexibility. When we get very, very rigid and we lock up and we don't have space to think differently or imagine how other people feel or or observe the way other people prefer to do things, when we get very rigid, the space for change shrinks and becomes very, very tiny. Hmm. Um, but the more that we mature emotionally, and can think of, you know, other people's perspectives while also holding our own and, and are receptive to feedback and noticing things in us that we want to be different, then change is very, very high. Many people change. It's a joy to watch people blossom. And right. it's just, it's the most beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and then Equally, it's as heartbreaking to watch people lock up and get in their own way or not be able to hear what people who really love them are saying. So it's hard when we talk about change. Do people change? Absolutely, they change. And do people change? No. Mm -hmm. Some people are very stagnant and very rigid. Um, and and some people, you know, blossom and and shift and so, I mean, most people are asking, do people change in the context of wishing someone that they love or who mm. means a lot to them would be different, mm. right? Mm. And so it's hard when I'll have people sit down and say, okay, Emily, do people change? And I have to ask them, what, do you what are you really asking me? Are you asking me if your marriage is going to be saved? Are you asking if your wife will be able to you know, be present for you or asking if your dad's going to be able to parent you appropriately. I don't, you know, a lot of times it's a very, very loaded question when people say, you know, are people capable of change? They're usually thinking of somebody in oh, particular. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, as you said, like some people are open to feedback. Some people are very rigid. Is there a common theme for people that are open to feedback? Like perhaps the way they were brought up or the way they were raised or compared to the people who are super rigid and maybe like the, perhaps they were raised? Um, I mean, obviously our upbringing has a lot to do with it, right? So what's tough is a lot of times when people receive feedback, they are hearing you are wrong. You're doing something wrong. You're doing something bad. You're not perfect. And so when we start to feel very defensive, right? Because it's hard to receive that message that maybe we need to do something better or that we hurt someone's feelings, especially if we weren't doing it on purpose. Mm -hmm. if we want to push that away, the idea that I'm bad, right? And all of this is so reflexive, right? There, it, There's no stream of consciousness that if, you know, your wife's to come to you and say, you hurt my feelings, that you were to almost like break off and go deep into thought, well, it's really hard to feel like I'm a bad person. So <laughs> therefore I'm going to reject the message. You know, <laughs> it's just very reflexive and there's no thought. Oh, I can't take this in. I'm not bad. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it like that. You're not, you never listened to me. It's actually your fault. Your feelings are hurt, right? <laughs> I've heard, I've had yeah. these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Versus being able to think, Hey, feedback is a gift. I'm going to take it and I'm going to sort through it. Is there anything in this feedback that I need to take? And sometimes we get feedback that does need to be discarded. It's not accurate. It doesn't mm. fit. It's coming from a tainted place from the giver. So it's not just as if anybody who comes and gives you feedback is always 100% right, but being able to sit with something and say what part of this is valuable mm. is, is challenging. So if we're told that we're doing something wrong or raised in a home where we are highly criticized or 
you know, our, our ego strength, right? If our egos aren't strong enough to be able to tolerate feedback, we're going to be inclined to push it away. What are some exercises to tolerate feedback like that? Um, Cause I feel over the last five to 10 years, I've done a lot of growing up in my thirties and now 41 and you know, that fake fun conversation you just had with yourself is definitely a conversation we've had in this household and every household probably has too. Um, Mm -hmm. but I feel like I've gotten pretty good at receiving feedback like that. Like I don't expect to be perfect. Um, I want to know what I can do better. I want to make sure I'm communicating properly. Um, I'm not doing anything to hurt my significant other. Um, so when I am told something like that, sometimes it takes a couple minutes for me to sit with it and um, oh sure mm-hmm. yeah but i feel that's pretty good a couple minutes is pretty good i think some people probably take days weeks months mm-hmm. if not longer um what are some exercises that people can practice to be a little more self-reflective and say you know this isn't necessarily a bad thing this is a stepping stone for us to move forward and be more successful in the future well i think walking themselves through that dialogue that you just you know, went through (laughs) is a big part of it, right? Mm. I think in general, okay, yes, we can have exercises for things, okay, for anything. For me as a clinician, if you were my client, when I'm sitting with any of my clients, my brain is always going to, what is the reason that this person has trouble receiving feedback, right? I'm just curious why they struggle with it in general, because that helps me know what exercise or what kind of internal dialogue or what part of them needs to be strengthened, Mm. right? Mm. Because if we have someone, let's say, who is um, neurodivergent and they have very rejection sensitive dysphoria, right? Like that's a thing how we talk about feeling rejected or taking feedback, it may look different than if I'm talking with somebody whose parent was perhaps narcissistic or um, extremely emotionally immature versus the kid that was raised in a home with an addict and was pretty much on their own, raised themselves, right? Each of these individuals are going to need some of the same messaging and also different messaging as well. So in general, though, to wind it back to your question, if people can even practice telling whoever is giving them, you know, the news that you hurt me or I need you to work better at this, could be an employer, that they just practice saying, thank you for telling me. I'm going to go sit with that. Mm, Or thank you for telling me. I'm, I'm going to think about that a little bit and and, least- and that's it. I, I hear you. I'm going to sit with it. Fine. Because sometimes we get feedback and it doesn't make sense to us, or we don't know where it's coming from, hmm. or we don't, we may sit with it and realize, you know what? I don't think I agree. We may sit with it and decide, you know what? An apology very much is warranted. I have something I need to own. Hmm. Um, so just bare minimum, if you're creating a little bit of space to give time for a response great. Most of the time, again, we're reflexively just responding to each Mm -hmm. other Mm -hmm. and there is no space for thought. So for those who are quick to get fiery or shut down or have a hard time receiving feedback or input to just practicing, thank you for sharing that with me. I'm going to think about it for a little bit. And depending on the person, you may think that if it's an employer, hey, can we have you know, a meeting to talk about this a little bit more, you know, in a few days or at the start of next week, or you may be telling a spouse, Hey, can we talk about this a little more tonight after the kids go to bed? Um, or, Hey, I'm feeling actually really upset by this. I think I just need to take a walk and think on it before we keep talking, whatever it looks like for you to give yourself a moment to take a beat and just, and think about it. And to ask ourselves, okay, if I'm having a really big reaction, what's, why? Mm -hmm. If you just let yourself be curious, it's like, why? Why am I getting so upset? Why do I feel so angry? Why do I feel like I want to fight back? Mm 
Mm. And sometimes that why takes a, a long time to, to uncover. And sometimes it, it's right at the surface, you know. Is there a common thread? Uh, you just said when people like respond fiery, um, is there a common thread with those people? Is is there something in their past or childhood, like a shame or a guilt um, that they grew up in like a household with? Um, I mean, that's really common. I think in general, when we're getting feisty, mm -hmm. it's important to remember that anger is a secondary feeling that means it comes second, secondary, right? Mm -hmm. So something else prompts the feeling of anger. And so maybe that is the feeling of shame. Maybe it's feeling rejected. Maybe it's the feeling of failure. Maybe it's fear. I didn't do this good enough. Am I going to lose X, Y, or Z? some more vulnerable feeling comes and prompts anger because anger energizes us, helps us be mobilized. And um, it's a really important feeling. The problem is, is if we get very prickly when we're angry, we can do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just something that we have to be mindful of. But yes, if we grow up in a home, though, where there is a lot of um, guilt based and shame based parenting, yes, absolutely. Feedback is going to feel excruciating. Because we're gonna it, hit. Yeah, we're going to hit on that literally in just a second. I want to ask you something before we hop on that. I've heard this numerous times. I know you have to never go to bed angry with your <laughs> so you're laughing. Sure. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I can't, I'm a, I'm a small child when I'm tired. I kind of start to shut down around 8 PM. <laughs> I just, <laughs> you know, um, I've been married for 17 years and wow. I know you look like you're 25. <laughs> so I don't, oh, I'm so glad this is being recorded. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah. for real. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, I've been married 17 years and sometimes you got to know when to call it. Just in general, there is research now that talks about how when we get tired, then obviously our filters go down. Mm -hmm. So a lot of couples do fight at night and this is for a variety of reasons, but in general, being exhausted means that we cannot fill filter ourselves we cannot filter what we're hearing and so the arguing can get rough at night and sometimes we just have to go to bed and pick it up in the morning when we feel refreshed and mm -hmm. and that does give us the chance to see what of it what of this this argument am I actually upset about because mm -hmm. sometimes with when we're rested it's like oh <laughs> sorry that actually wasn't a big deal um, I think what is important, though, is that people have to understand if you're going to put a pin in your argument, whether that is because it's getting too heated and you have to go to bed or you have to take a walk or we got to pause. Uh oh, it's, you know, child care pickup time. I got to go get the kids. We literally can't keep fighting. Um, you have to go back to it. Mm -hmm. So we can't pull this. Oh, I'm too upset. I got to take a walk or let's just go to bed. We'll talk about it in the morning and then never return. You can't pull that business. Yep. So if you're going to pause something that has to be talked about, there has to be ideally a set time for when we can come back to it, especially for people who are more anxious so arguing can make some people wildly anxious. They, you know, they're really f afraid of loss or whatnot. So to know, hey, we have to stop here, but let's pick it up in two hours after my business call, or let's make sure after we drop the kids off at school, we're going to get our coffee. Let's, let's finish this tomorrow. You mm. have to circle back. And that goes a, a long way in building safety you know, between partners. and I like, agree with that so much. That was something that I think we first, when we, we first started dating that we learned, I was like, I need a set time to come back to this because uh, the open-endedness just drives me insane. It's like, I uh -huh. I want a resolution to this one way or another. I need, we need to resolve this and we can move forward. Just letting it float out there, not knowing when you're going to touch on again. And it's always weird when you're like, um, can we, can we talk about that argument that pissed us I both know. off? Right. It's like, if it's your set time and date, it's like, okay, let's just go. We, we know it's on the calendar. Let's just settle this once and for all. So super important, super, yeah. super important. 
It is uh, important. Um, something that's really important. Um, so see, speaking of sleep deprivation, it's something that's going to be happening to me shortly, uh, having a baby in March. So my, my first child, so I'll be learning a Yay. lot. Yay is right. Um, with that event coming up and also, like I said, the therapy I've been receiving, diving into my childhood, um, this is a, another timely time, I guess you can say to have this conversation is I'm really self-reflecting a lot of things that I grew up with things I want to bring into uh, my mm -hmm. child's mm -hmm. life, things I want to stop <laughs> with me. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I feel like uh, this is a good time to, to like dive a little more into childhood and the households we grew up in. Um, if I had a pie chart and the pie was made up hundred percent, how much of my personality and or baggage or like who I am and the things I bring with me are from my childhood and the environment I grew up in. And is there a specific like age range that's like really like most effective to when things like stick with somebody as a child? Oh, well, <clears throat> okay. So the pie chart percentage, I don't know how quantifiable that could be. I mean, listen, there's people who still love debating nature versus nurture, right? Mm -hmm. But a massive amount has to do with our upbringing and a, a huge amount. And, um, you know, it's a lot of pressure on parents, mm. which is hard. I think as parents, it's important to remember that we can't take too much credit or too much blame for how our children turn out. Um, but, oh, my heavens, our upbringing is so incredibly impactful. And um, but research does show that between the ages of zero and five, when attachment is really being formed, it's extremely powerful ages mm -hmm. so that is that is giving your child the little internal compass of what can I expect from my caregivers and I'm going to take that and use it to to see what I can expect from the world and so unfortunately that's it's not that is not accurate but you know, in, in a way we could say our parents kind of imprint on us and they give us a lens through which we go and view the world. So if a parent is checked out and isn't attentive to their kid, then the kid, of course, is going to say, oh, this is how people are, right? Mm. Because my parents are my first experience of people. So people don't care about me and people won't show up for me. And um, it's it's just me, myself and I. So if we have a parent that's very attuned to our feelings and cares and is patient and loving, and the child grows up knowing if I get in a pickle, I can ask for help and somebody's going to come, then what are they going to think about the rest of the world? Hey, there's good in the world. If I need help, I'm going to find the safe people. And so much confidence comes not from knowing that I can figure everything out. It's really like, hey, if I blow it, that there are going to be people that can help me. How nice is that? Mm. So our parents really do have a big impact on how we turn out. So, you know, in my practice, I do spend a hell of a lot of time talking about parents and that's painful obviously, for a lot of reasons. And the point is not to make parents the villain in our stories, right? I have three children and I can very much see where I am doing harm. <laughs> I do my <laughs> best. You know, I joke to my husband, I'm like, do we save for college or save for therapy? And I'm basically keeping a little journal like, hey, you can take this into your therapist when you're older. I'll <laughs> tell you all my missteps, you know, <laughs> it just is, you know, so I don't I'm not out to villainize parents because it is a very, very emotionally demanding job. Um, but even with the best of intentions and even with parents who are are fairly solid, none of us get to leave childhood without a few nicks and bruises. Some of us leave our childhood with giant gaping wounds and a crushed skull and, you know, lost a limb. And some of us just have a few bruises and little scars here and there, but, but we can't ignore our upbringing. Hmm. So, you know, with you now having a child on the way, 
there is something that's very beautiful, but also very painful um, about parenting. It exposes in us the parts of us that really need to be healed still. And I, I say that a lot because we can have this fantasy of how we're going to be as a parent. We can read and say, we know that we're supposed to emotionally show up for our kids and make room for big feelings, et cetera, et cetera, right? But when it comes down to it, um, we're having to manage our own big feelings and our children's big feelings at the same time. And it's very easy to get dysregulated when we're parenting, to get overwhelmed. And in those moments when our feelings get really, really big and our brains start to shut down, guess what we guess what we default to? Mm-hmm. We default to the way that we were parented. This is like our pre-programming. So, you know, for anybody who's going to become a parent, that you really do have to start saying, hey, it, I'm not going to be perfect as a parent. I'm going to be learning this whole way. My goal is not to be a perfect parent. My goal is to be a teachable parent. My goal is to be a parent that pays attention and can own their mistakes and make the repair when I need to, and even let my child be the consultant about my parenting. Mm. Your kids will tell you if you listen when you hurt their feelings. It's so helpful. If we listen to our kids, they will help us parent. It's actually really beautiful. We have to be willing to listen to our kids. Um, Yes. I know of a situation. I'm not getting, I don't have any details, but I know of a situation where people's parents are not willing to listen to mm-hmm. their kids. I think that's really good advice. Um, what What do you say in a situation like that when someone's parents are just really lis- willing to listen to their kids? Well, I, I mean, at this point, a lot of the individuals I'm working with, they're adults, right? right. So sitting with them, the conversation is around, to what extent do you think your parent can hear you? Because if we're kind of looking and seeing, okay, hey, we have a parent here that really cares, good intentions, they're open to feedback, even though it may be a little bumpy and rocky and they're older. So can we have grace for their pace of making change? Okay, great. Let's fight to make things better. There are some situations when you know, I can kind of read through the lines. I'm listening to their history. The parent is not safe. Hmm. And I don't think that it's helpful to keep pushing an adult child back to a parent that is not safe hmm. because we're setting them up to, to continually be rewounded and to be shut down, right? Is there going to be a good return on investment? So, you know, what, what that looks like with an adult is, yeah, it kind of depends on on their parent. Yeah, that's something, um, I won't say me personally, but I'll just say it's something that's been dealt dealing with, I guess you can mm-hmm. say, um, trying to deal with, I guess you could say is um, lack of listening from an older parent just doesn't want to listen, doesn't uh, feel the need to listen, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a tough situation. So I was just wondering, wondering what you thought in a situation where they just don't, mm-hmm. how do you how do you get someone to listen that doesn't want to listen? <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you really can't. Right. So right. unfortunately, if you have a parent that cannot receive feedback, is not interested in listening, they're very shut down, then you have to tailor, okay, well then what kind of relationship is there for me to salvage? If mm-hmm. it's never going to be one that's emotionally close, then there's a lot of grieving involved in that. Mm-hmm. It hurts. It sucks. We want, who doesn't want their parent, Right. 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 Eventually, if that part of you starts to shut down where you're completely disinterested, that says a lot. Um, So unfortunately, you or people in your position may have to think, okay, what is there here for me to salvage? Mm. What can time with my parent look like that is respectful, maybe? How can we be respectful? Um, And and, and and so the bar gets dropped 
we can't have a very high bar for our parents if they're constantly showing us their limitations. And the beautiful thing is, is that there are people out in the world that we can go find that will listen to us and do want to create something lovely with us, good, you know, partnerships and friendships and whatnot. But that doesn't take away from the sting of having a parent Mm. reject us in that way. But it is out there in the world. So many of us have to leave our family of origin and go find, find something sweeter out in the world. And Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Cause you said setting, lowering the bar, if you will, almost like setting, setting a new set of expectations, I guess, is mm-hmm. perhaps probably the way to go. Something I do yeah. want to touch on, not yet, because we're getting there, is uh, setting boundaries, especially family members. Like that, this, it almost sounds like it kind of all, everything intertwines, I guess. It, it when, does. When, when yeah. talking about this, which is awesome. Um, I got a couple questions I want to touch on. We were kind of hitting on a little, little bit ago. Um, I want to start with a positive. Can you give me an example or two of like really good parenting? Like if I were to come to you and said, I did this with my child and you were giving me a pat on the back. Is there like a scenario or so that would kind of come to your head? Like what does good parenting look like? Sure. Um, gosh, there's a number of things. A lot of it does come down to how we care for our children emotionally and to back it up, you know, Maslow, he has this hierarchy of needs. If someone doesn't know who Maslow is and his hierarchy of needs, just do a quick Google search. But very foundationally, we need our physical needs cared for. We need to know that we're not going to get stabbed in the middle of the night. We mm-hmm. need somewhere safe to sleep and we need food and water. Mm-hmm. We need clothes on our body. Okay. So parents need to care for physical needs, but then come emotional needs and emotional needs are so incredibly important because that is where intimacy and connection and safety are all built right so when we're looking at good parenting if your future child is going to come to you and say hey daddy like you made me sad right or you're making me mad that you would say oh no I made you mad. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. And when your kid comes to you with big feelings, especially about you as the parent, it's not just, okay, most, most parents have room for, oh, I hurt my knee or Bobby made me sad. But it's really hard when the kid comes to the parent and says, you are the one that hurt me. You are making me mad. I don't want you. I don't like you. I want a new daddy or whatever. Oh, God. Right? It, oh, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Oh, it's super yeah. Nor- it's very normal, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That rather than taking it personally as a failure, it's a moment to say, oh, my goodness. You, oh, tell me more. What did I do to make you sad? Hmm. And well, you didn't let me have my cartoon or, you know, whatever it could be. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, I can see why you feel sad. That's normal to feel sad about not getting your cartoon. Mm-hmm. Right? That That's fine. You're just making room for big feelings. Or if you did hurt your kid's feelings that you were to say, yeah, that that was mommy yelled too loud. That scared you when I yelled. Mm. Oh, it's my job to stay calm, and I didn't stay calm, right? Yeah. How much is how much of a role is staying calm in these situations, oh right? My gosh, <laughs> every honestly, it's unfortunate that everything kind of rises and falls on staying calm. Yeah. Because when we're calm, we can take whatever our kids throw at us. But again, when we start to get worked up inside and we're exhausted or we're frustrated or our kids aren't doing what we want or they're fighting or whatever, when our feelings start to go up, 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 we're the bucket for our children's feelings, there's not as much room in there. So a lot of it has to do with staying calm. And Mm. so there's a lot of repairing as parents that really do revolve around getting angry or frustrated or whatnot. I mean, there are definitely some times, um, oh goodness, that I, I've yelled at my children and it's, I am very not proud of it, but I did it and it happened. And mm-hmm. I remember one time I 
I scared one of my children because I, I just like popped off and I hollered and I was probably about something incredibly stupid, you know? And so my kid's crying. You scared me, mom. Like I did. I scared you. And it's my job to keep you calm. Tell me what it was like for you when I yelled. Mm. What were you thinking? I want you to know that I have calmed down and I'm not angry anymore. So it's not just about acknowledging their feelings or your mistake, but also, hey, just so you know, it's safe to approach me again. So um, a lot of good parenting is is truly about owning our mistakes. Yes, getting it right the first time is lovely. And I, I wish I could get it right all the time at the first whack, but that's just not reality. So yes, I'd love to get it right the first time, but it's so much about making a mistake and correcting it. Because that also shows your children that you are safe in a different mm. perspective. Mm. If mom or dad get it wrong, they're going to own it. I can tell them if they upset me. I can tell them if they hurt my feelings. It's okay if I get angry. They're not going to push me away. They're not going to shut down. They're not going to invalidate me. And this creates room in the home for the kid to be whoever and whatever they need to be. Mm. And even if... You know, my child is upset with me and I tr sincerely didn't do anything wrong. And they're just mad because they didn't get a toy or they didn't get TV or they wanted a sucker. They got told, no, you can't go to a friend's house. They're still allowed to be upset. Mm -hmm. And I can validate that they're upset and they're still not going to get what they want. Right. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's OK to be angry. I get bummed when I don't get more ice cream. I love ice cream. You could be mad, um, but there's still not going to be any more ice cream. So we can still lovingly hold boundaries while validating feelings with our kids. So I, I imagine people listening to this, I could be wrong, but I think I'm right, is there's going to be a handful of people listening to this that said, this is so garbage. I didn't grow up like totally. this. My dad yep. yelled at me and he he got on my ass and he he was a tough ass and I'm a better person because of it. And I'm yes. going to be like that when I'm a kid. Like, so what do you, what would you say to those people listening that would be their argument? Well, a lot of people do push back. Well, your children need to respect you, right? That's a big one that I hear a lot. Well, how are my kids going to respect me? And I have to ask them, do you, do you want respect or do you want them to fear you? Mm -hmm. And I think we get the two confused a lot. We can absolutely use fear-based parenting. We can also use shame-based parenting. We can, we can use our children's feelings and um, get them to behave in the way that we want. If we just want a high control relationship. Is that what shame is? Let's just dive into what a shame-based parenting is. What is shame and what is shame-based parenting? Well, shame in general is the feeling that I am bad. Intrinsically, I am bad, right? Not mm -hmm. I did a bad thing but I am bad. And so it can be hard for children because they can't hold two things at one time. So if you're going heavy on them and, and really emphasizing that they made a mistake, they can start to feel like they are the mistake, especially if our responses to them are very disproportionate, right? So for example, like children that are raised in homes where there's a lot of abuse, the child often tries to adapt by being as good as possible because that's how they learn to stay safe, right? I'll clean mm -hmm. up after myself. I'll be really quiet. I'll keep my siblings very still. I know the rules of the home. And so let's say maybe the kid like knocks over a glass of water and they get beat. The, the reaction is so disproportionate that the kid can't even make sense. It's like, this is such a big response there must be something about me that is bad, that is warranting this treatment, right? So if we're going really heavy handed on our kids, um, they start to feel like they are the bad thing. Mm. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so if a parent uses a lot of shaming language or guilting language, well, you're just making me so sad. You don't love me. I'm, I'm a bad mom because you're not listening and whatever. If we're constantly using language as parents that's saying, look at kid, look at what you are doing to me. Look at how you are making me suffer. You are making me angry. Mm -hmm. You are making me disappointed. Um, or we're using things like silent treatment. The child and children are very narcissistic. It ha they, you know, right? Everything revolves around them, especially when they're very young. We learn to temper children's, you know, narcissism and and help them understand not everything in their world is about them, but young children, everything is about them. So if a parent is coming in very heavy handed and using language that implies that the kids a screw up, then a kid absorbs that it's because, you know, my parents, I'm, I'm a bad kid. And so that's why dad has to drink or I'm a naughty kid. And that's why wow. mom explodes. Right. And again, it's hard because this isn't like a very, very solvent stream of consciousness for a child, right? They're just living in it. And a lot of times as we're adults, we look backwards and it's like, oh my goodness, the, this is the messaging that I picked up, right? I mean, so kids, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Children really do need help sorting through their experiences and making sense of their experiences. So if a parent isn't able to say, oh yes, you were mad, your brother knocked down your tower, I would be angry too. Mm -hmm. The kid is learning about themselves in their world. Oh yeah, if somebody hurts me, it makes me angry. That's a normal feeling. What do I do with that feeling? Kids who are raised with parents who are very shaming or guilting and whatnot, they, they don't have anyone to help sort through cognitively what their experiences are what's happening to me so they just think like i'm bad it must be me right the world revolves around me so it must be me things mm. aren't going right so it must be me and they don't have a parent to help offset that message so they start to learn i am a bad kid i'm a bad kid i make people feel this way i make my mom feel this way you know, I forgot to take out the trash. So I'm getting silent treatment for five days. She won't even look at me. I, I'm i that bad. My parent can't talk to me. So it's, it's yeah, it's really sad. Mm. I'm like so excited, but so nervous to have a kid at the same time. I just, I want to do the best that I possibly can. And um, you brought up guilt a few times. I want to touch on guilt. And I think that's mm -hmm. something that I've had to deal with since I grew up and it's really kind of starting to like come to the surface now and I'm being enlightened about it, which is a good mm -hmm. thing because that's how you fix it and end it. Um, in one of my therapy sessions, I was there over the last few months or so with, with my wife, um, got brought up that I'm consistently saying like, what did I do? What did I do wrong? I'm, I'm just consistently saying that, even though it's like my wife might be like frustrated or angry about something. And I immediately go to myself, what did I do? What did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. What could I have done better? Um, so to me, I think that's a clear cut sign of guilt. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Can you touch on like, like you just did with shame. Can you touch on guilt and what it looks like growing up in a household full of guilt for a child? Sure. Well, first, I think it's very important to understand that guilt actually is such an important feeling. I love guilt. It's very, very critical to us acting in line with our values. Guilt is just like a little warning light that's supposed to come on that says, oh, hold on, Ryan. Oh, hold on, Emily. That thing that you did, you didn't act in alignment with your values, right? Mm -hmm. So go make it right. It just is that little clue inside that we need to go fix something. Oh, babe, I'm sorry. I didn't, I don't like how that came out. I, I shouldn't talk to you like that. I wasn't upset with you. I was upset with something else. I'm sorry. Guilt is wonderful because when it is appropriately turning on, then all it does is it helps us to go make a correction, make a fix, and then we get to go on. Happy as can be right? It prompts hmm. us to make a correction. The problem is, is when we have the little guilt light 
coming on when we didn't do anything wrong. So we would call that inappropriate guilt. It is guilt that does not fix or it does not fit. There's nothing that needs to be fixed. So it can be really confusing if we're constantly feeling bad about things. Then I would actually say, okay, well, what did you do that was outside of your values? And if there is no answer, then it may be the clue that we're dealing with shame. It's not, oh, I did a bad thing. I am the bad thing. So if a parent uses a lot of guilting to get their child to behave, to coerce them, then, then um, yeah, that's a, that's a powerful factor, right? So like mm. now a lot of people are experiencing guilt trips over the holidays. Maybe they want to go with their partner's family for the holiday, or maybe they want to take a vacation and they want to go just travel for the week instead of going to visit family. It's a totally normal thing to want to do, but you can have mom. Oh, I've waited all year to see you. This is the only thing I live for. You mean you're not going to let me see my grandkids? Oh my God, oh, keep going, keep going. How could you do this to me? This is all I've talked to my friends about, right? And so oh you have God. a parent that's like you are wounding me with your choice. Ouch, yep. Yep. ouch. And so now the adult child is thinking, oh my gosh, my guilt light is turning on because I'm wounding my parent. Look at me hurting my parent by withholding my grand, you know, her grandchildren. When really there is no wrongdoing, there's no, there, there's no wrongdoing, but that feeling of guilt compels us to forego the thing that we want to say, okay, well, to get this guilt light off, that means I have to do what you want me to do. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a wonderful manipulation tactic, quite frankly, if, you know, if you're raised with that, if you're constantly raised hearing, you are hurting me. So you need to make me feel better. You need to make me feel better by behaving. Then children get very used to saying, okay, what do I need to do to make sure my parent still feels good about themselves? And if I disrupt the home with my big feelings or with my preference, then that's a bad thing. I'm bad. I'm supposed to make sure that my parents feel good about themselves. So, how do you approach how do you approach your parent and have this conversation with them especially if they're not willing to listen and also uh, I think a term that I probably should have put on the outline is also like victim mentality uh, oh, they have sure. a victim constant victim mentality it is an extremely difficult conversation I don't know yes. how to have it um I'm not asking for free therapy advice here but I I do imagine <laughs> there are there are numerous people listening to this that are in my position that just don't know how to have this conversation so I love to sure. hear your advice well, and again, it comes back to what is a parent capable of? Hmm. Because a lot of parents don't even have the awareness. It's not like they sat and calculated, how do I make my kid feel so shitty about themselves that they're going to do what I want, hmm. right? It is it is heavy immaturity. So to go to a parent and say, hey, you're trying to make me feel this way so that I'll do what you want. Oh, how could you say that? All I want to do was see my grandkids, mm -hmm. right? I, you're calling me a bad grandma because I want to see my kids for Christmas. There's no winning, right? There's just no winning. There if is the parent no winning. Does he have the awareness? That is a poor return on your emotional investment. So part of holding on to our peace is no longer having those conversations and letting your parent have their crummy feelings. Yeah, mom, I know. I know you're going to miss us. I hate that you're going to miss us for the holidays. But yeah, we're still going to go do X. <laughs> yeah, but we're still, right? yes. <laughs> it's like you are allowed to feel sad. I know. I know, mom. This is really hard to hear. And you just validate the feelings, but you hold on to your plans. And at the same time, that's the conversation you're having. But internally, you're saying, 
you're having to hold on to your sense of self and say, I know I'm not doing anything wrong, but your parent is trying to make sure you feel like you are doing something wrong so that you comply. So your internal monologue, and if you have a good spouse or loving friends that get it, that are even there to be your hype man, Mm. hey, you're not doing anything wrong. It's okay for your mother to be disappointed. She, She can survive being disappointed. You're separating and letting your immature parent hold their own feelings while you hold your feelings. I am allowed to let my mother be sad and still pick what's best for my family this year. Mm. It's okay for your parent to have salty feelings. It's okay for them to be disappointed. It's okay. I mean, I don't love that. It doesn't feel good. Well, sometimes you need to be told it's okay. You know, Mm -hmm. you really do because- and that's not how I grew up. And um, it is just, it's good to, to know that. Um, so yeah, the, I, like, I would, I would say though, too, the more that an adult tries to explain themselves to their parent and explain, well, this is why it's good for me to take that trip instead of coming home for Christmas. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The more that you start explaining yourself, the more downhill it's going to go. Really? Because a parent is often going to try to poke holes. The more that you're talking about it, the more you're exposing yourself to them weeping and feeling bad. It all depends on your tolerance level, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, for me, I think that it is really important to be as kind as possible. That is what I personally value, right? I, I want boundaries to be shared and as kind and as loving and preserving way as possible. But that being said, there are some parents who are so incredibly immature or even painful or unsafe where kindness somewhat needs to be set aside and you're just going for assertive. You're keeping it short, (laughs) you're keeping it sweet, and you're not talking about it a long time Mm. because doing that leaves you open to being damaged. So, you know, there's no one perfect size fits all you know, tip because every parent has different capabilities. So there are some parents that can have a full conversation and eventually come to understand, okay, well, you're right. You guys get to do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. I'm, I don't like it, but I get it. You, you have your own family. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they can come and really rest to see your perspective. There are some parents that will never, ever see your perspective, could care less they are going to be perpetual victims. And don't you pry that out of their, their cold hands. You, you know, so in some ways you just have to make peace with your parent being a victim and it being uncomfy and knowing that the little guilt that you feel inside is not actually guilt. It's just a growing pain. Mm. What you, what you just said, everything you just said spoke to me a lot because um, I do have a parent that plays a victim mentality all the time. I can't really feel that guilt light that comes on and stays on all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So what you just said spoke to me loudly. And I think something I'm kind of terrible at is um, setting boundaries. I know you have a lot of really good information on your Instagram as far as setting boundaries go, especially with family. I want to hit on some of that. Um, <laughs> I know, like I said, people listen to this. This is so, so relatable to everybody. Like what are some key tips and advice for people that are trying to set boundaries with family members or loved ones. It's a credibly difficult situation. They won't receive it. Well, Mm -hmm. what do you, what do you do? Well, again, it depends on the person, right? But first and foremost, you have to even know what your own personal limitations are and your own personal needs, because your boundaries need to be tailored around what your needs are and what your limitations are and what your capabilities are and what your resources are. So what do you even have to give? What is it that you need to replenish in yourself? What behaviors make you feel icky when you do them? What areas do you feel good about giving? So you, you have to step back and, um, do some personal assessment first and foremost, right? 
because what you convey to your family or your friends or your boss need to flow out of the parts of you that need to be cared for or protected or honored. And, um, you know, our boundaries in general, they shift and change over time as our needs shift and, and change, right? Like your boundaries and your needs and your limitations are going to look very different mm -hmm. when you have a newborn compared to, you know, what my children look like. They're a fair amount older now mm -hmm. and what you have to give. So you have to be checking in with yourself. What And, and a lot of that too has to do with checking in with resentment right? If you're feeling kind of pissed at somebody or your heart rate's going up when you're around someone, or you feel your hands clenching when your boss makes a request or your father calls to ask for something, or your sister's calling for, you know, another loan that's never going to get repaid. <laughs> <laughs> those, those angry or resentful feelings really do indicate where a boundary needs to be set. You may be giving more than you are able to give or feeling taken advantage of or exhausted. So your feelings are so helpful because they're feedback. Mm. They're your internal feedback. Yeah, this is super helpful and insightful. I'm just like kind of thinking out loud. It's like clockwork sometimes with some family members. It's like a month, month and a half goes by, everything's fine. And it's just like, I get, I get a mouthful of things I didn't do. Over oh, the sure. last month, month and a half, I was like, I've been busy. I didn't, I didn't know I was supposed to do X, Y, Z. Did not know I was supposed to travel home. Didn't know I was supposed to call so many times in a week or something mm -hmm. like that. It's uh, it's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. It can take a it can take a lot of emotional energy. It does to contain family members who just are spilling over and yeah. have endless needs and feel like it's everyone else's responsibility to make sure they feel okay. Now, I'm never it doing is, enough yeah. and never mm -hmm. enough. It's never yeah. going to be enough. <laughs> right. And if you can hold in the back of your mind, Hey, no matter how much I give, I'll still be an F up. Mm -hmm. Then what? Just choose what you want to give. Mm. Because it's never going to be enough. So you might as well set the metric system in accordance with what you feel good about. Mm. It's better than both of you feeling pissed. We might as well just let the parent be pissed. <laughs> you feel okay about it, right? What, what sucks is that I kind of have a relationship where it's like, I have to be careful sharing my successes because my successes would be held against me. Like, oh, you got a raise? Well, that means you can afford to X, Y, Z. You can mm -hmm. now fly into town or you know what I mean? Like I live that life now. It's mm -hmm. it to me, it's pretty shitty. It sucks. It sucks. I got to live that sure. life, but I do. Well, then that is also telling you where boundaries need to be set. Yeah. Turns out you can't share personal information because it's going to get used against you. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you have buddies that can celebrate yeah. that you got a raise, mm -hmm. but you're not wanting to give ammunition to people who are going to fire at you. Mm. And that sucks because you know what? Your parents should be your biggest hype people. Yeah, but it does suck. It doesn't always work like that. And it, it actually, you know, sometimes parents are very envious of their children, mm. very threatened by their own children, feel like they deserve to be cared for, provided for by their children. And um, that's not in the parenting contract, but, <laughs> you know. You you had a post recently. I'm trying to find it, but I don't want to keep scrolling while we're talking. It was about like we're wired to see our parents as good. Yes. Can mm -hmm. you hit on that? Because I think that's what's disappointing, right? Is we yeah. do see our parents as good. And I love my family. I have a good family. So I want to make that clear. We are wired to see our parents as good. It is this is re, this is bringing me back. It's been a couple of years since I've read the four agreements. If if that's something you're familiar with, um, that's a book I really want to read again. It's like the things that we are, we didn't choose mm -hmm. <laughs> in life. Um, can you touch on that, that post that you had recently about we're wired to see our parents as good, but that's just not always the case. Yeah. Well, you can even just think in terms of safety when we're being raised, who protects us from the wolves, right? Or the elements or the mm. bad guys, it's our parents. 
So developmentally, we are wired to stay close to our parents in close proximity to them because they are supposed to protect us. Mm. So if we have upset feelings or we start to see our parents as bad, then what happens? We're going to want to take a few steps away from them. So it behooves us safety wise to see our parents as good so that we want to be close right? Mm. Which is, we're just hardwired to see our parents as good. They're our attachment people. It's it's part of the bond, right? Mm. So when we are little, we will forgive a lot in our parents and again, attribute our parents' poor behavior to being our fault. Because if I'm the bad one, then mom can stay good. If mm. I'm the bad one, then dad can stay good. If his addiction is about me not being a good enough kid, then my dad's image can be preserved. It's not about him not being strong enough. It's not about him having an illness. It's because I caused this. Okay, my mom is very scary. She explodes, but it's my fault. And if it's my fault that I set her off, then she can still be good. And so as we get older and things start to make a little more sense or our feelings continue to indicate, no, this doesn't feel good when I'm around this parent, it's hard because it's a dethroning, really. Mm. And and sadly, not all of our parents probably should have been parents. Um, there are parents who do more harm than good. Mm. And a lot of parents, they're doing their best, but they're very, very limited right? And I guess we can have grace for them. Mm. But it is really painful to come to terms with my parent cannot give me what I need. My parent cannot hear me. And I so desperately want them to hear me. I want to be understood by my parent. I want my parent to see me. And of course, we're going to fight for years. We'll fight for decades to get our parent to see us and connect with us and know us and to say, sorry, but the more that we fight for our parent to give us what they may not be able to give us, we we, res we resist being able to actually adjust and create something that is on their level. Mm. And it can be hard if we're demanding from a parent, like, see how you hurt me. I need you to see it. Mm. And they can't. They, they just can't, they won't, they refuse. Then we get stuck in this place where we're not able to shift into acceptance. And if we can't shift into acceptance, then we can't create something that's going to kind of function. <laughs> you know, we can't create, you know, the relationship they're able to have. Mm. And it's sad. It is really sad. It is sad to have our parents dethroned. Mm. So yeah, dis disappointing is like the right word, right? It is. It's just yeah. when you, when you kind of like have that realization, mm -hmm. it is disappointing. Um, I will say like, like I want to, I, like I, I have that guilt. I feel like I'm like talking, I get it about my family. I have that guilt right now. I grew up really well. Um, like you said, I think there's just some scenarios and situations that some people just can't necessarily handle very well. Yeah. And um, I make the analogy. I don't know if anybody else has this in their mind, I'm sure you probably see this on the beach or people in LA, like uh, you ever like run sprints or you see the people running sprints with a parachute behind them <laughs> and they're running and all of a sudden they get kind of pulled back and they start to slow down. Like that's mm -hmm. how I feel like my life has been probably the last 10 years where I'm running towards the things that I really want. And I have that parachute pulling me back. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, people always say, get rid of the negative people in your life. Right. And it's, I guess if they're friends, it's probably easier to do, but when it's family uh -huh. and, and you're actually blood relative, mm -hmm. a little more difficult, uh, not quite as yes. easy. And those boundaries are extremely difficult to set up and stick with. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it yeah. is hard in general. There's a big split. We have people who are very quick to cut off, mm. right? Qu very quick to cut off, very low tolerance. You're out grudge holders, you know, and for some people it is easy for them to just cut off. They'll cut off whoever, whenever you're mm -hmm. dead to me. And then we have the other set of people who, um, persist far too long, mm -hmm. like way too long without making adjustments way too long without 
unfortunately may be cutting somebody out that needs to be. And ironically, many of us house both splits where we tend to cut off the wrong people too quickly <laughs> and keep the people that do need to be cut off mm. and, and are too long suffering in the wrong areas. But yeah, for me as a, a therapist, I am not a big cut off therapist. You know, I'm, I'm very pro salvage. What can be salvaged? Mm -hmm. Um, Again, just in general, because I think our culture has swung far too towards everybody's toxic, cut them all out. This doesn't feel good for me. This isn't serving me. And we're a, just a little touch selfish. Um, but there are cases where truly full cutoff is the only way to stay safe. What is and like a sign or a symptom of that? When, like if someone were to come to you and say, hey, I'm, should I cut my family off? Is there like a scenario or situation? Where that is. Um, a lot of it does come down to physical, financial, okay. or emotional safety. Mm. So to be like very extreme about it, if mm. somebody is saying like, oh, my father keeps taking credit cards out in my name, um, or yeah, I found out that my mom's been using my social security number for X, Y, or Z, <laughs> or, you know, there are some cases of where abuse persists even into adulthood. Um, or if we have language that just like they can't come around their parent without being extremely berated. Uh, also, if there are very young children too, right? If, so if there's an extremely active addiction where there is risk involved, you know, again, physical financial mm -hmm. safety are really important emotional safety is as well of course i'm not downplaying that but there are some scenarios where it's just it's very apparent that this person is not safe and there are immediate dangers to that bottom hierarchy of needs right mm -hmm. um so you know, physical abuse, things like that. It's just, it's not tolerated. But then we have more complicated dynamics where in some family systems, like the parent, it, when everybody gets together, together, the parents are trying to actively cause the children to fight, are, is causing chaos, um, extremely demeaning. You know, some people say, I can't go around my parent without feeling like, I don't know if they're complimenting me or insulting me. Um, and nothing I do is good enough. They're still yelling at me. Um, they're picking on my spouse. Sometimes if, especially if you have narcissistic parents, they'll really come for the spouse. Um, and so to protect your spouse again, or your children, that has to happen. So Sometimes a full cutoff is needed to create repair. And then you can sort through what data have I been getting from my family over the past few decades? Where are the pain points? What leaves me vulnerable to getting hurt? What sorts of things can I not share with this parent? And when they've done some work to rebuild, then they may decide they want to crack open the door and see if they can have a more boundaried, shallow relationship with the parent. So sometimes cut off for a period to then step back in to try again, right? There's any number of things that people can try. And ideally, I wish everybody had the luxury of going to therapy. It's it's helpful if you have a therapist who really gets family dynamics and family systems and can walk alongside and help say, hey, no, you're not crazy. This sounds really bad. This sounds off. Right. Right. Versus, you know, because a lot of kids are raised being told they're being dramatic. Mm. So then every time something feels bad or feels icky or they're hurt, they've been taught, well, that's just me being dramatic. Mm. So they have already undercut and learned to invalidate their own need for boundaries. Because again, if you're dramatic, then it's you're the bad one, not the parent. So it's tricky. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I, uh, I wish everybody had the opportunity to go and everybody saw the benefit of going. There's a lot of people that just refuse because that's how they grew up. Um, sure. I, think, I think times are 
changing. I think things are swinging in a positive direction when it comes to therapy. Um, it kind of seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, to set boundaries and to live like a happier life uh, with the people that's around you, even though if they cause you pain, we all need to do maybe perhaps somewhat of a readjusting or a better job of perspective and mindset and setting expectations for those people around us. So that way they can't disappoint us. Does that sound like it makes sense? Sure. I mean, I suppose I would, what I would say is people do teach you what you can expect from them. Just like you are also trying to teach people what they can expect from you. If you tell a boss, Hey, just so you know, I don't take, I, I don't take work calls and I don't check my work email after 6 30 PM. If they call you at 7 30 PM and you take that call, what mm. did you just teach your boss? <laughs> well, I said my boundary was this, but Hey, go mm. ahead and walk all over it. We, mm. so we have to teach people what they can expect from us. And then we have to receive what information people are giving us too. And so there is some risk involved in building relationships with loved ones too. If I give you this little piece of me and you handle it with grace or you handle it with compassion, then hmm, maybe next time I'm just going to give you a fraction more and see if you can still handle that well. And so not, we can't be black and white about our relationships. We have to, I think of it sometimes like a gobstopper, right? You know, you could suck on the yeah. gobstoppers and they have all the different colors and the different layers. Everybody's going to fall in different relation to us. And there are some people that are just going to be good golf buddies and that's it. You, you don't have deep convo, but cool. Go have a nice golf sesh, or it's a girlfriend you go to the movies with. Wonderful. But then you should have a few people who you can have very deep conversation with, who you know, if I need somebody to cry to, they're going to listen and not make fun of me. They're not going to gossip about me. They're going to be patient with me. And I can do the same for them. So we have to pay attention to the feedback that we get from people. If we tell them that we're having a bit of a hard time, they're like, oh yeah, that sucks anyway. And they change the subject. Well, mm. you're probably not going to want to go to them next time <laughs> or maybe try one more time. Maybe they were having an off day, right? But if you keep getting messaging like that, then okay, they're limited and just adjust according to that. So it's not even so much about protecting ourselves from disappointment, but yes, but we do also have to learn how to tolerate disappointment too. Mm -hmm. And that means not quitting and just saying, well, people suck, <laughs> you know, no, some people suck. Yeah. They do. Yeah. I would love to say everybody in the world is just has room for you and they're going to get you, but they are not, mm. but some will, you got to go find your people. This is awesome. I know I don't have you for so much longer. Um, cause you got to roll here. There's a couple things I want to hit on before I do let you go. If that's cool. Um, one thing that came up in my mind earlier in the conversation that I didn't find room to ask was um, punishment for a child. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in the age where, you know, getting the belt wasn't necessarily unheard of. Um, I got for, spanked. Mm -hmm. Pretty common. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts as far as like punishment goes? Is there, I, I know there's no like good or bad. Is a good punishment? Is a bad punishment? Is mm -hmm. like, how do punishments affect children growing up and have you found an effective way to perhaps punish children that seems to work well without like damaging them for in the future? Sure. I think that it is helpful to shift our mindset from punishment to discipline. When we are trying to discipline a child, we are trying to nurture them and teach them mm. and educate them, right? versus punishment is just you did a bad thing so suffer <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, yeah. but kids do have to learn that there are consequences to their choices so it's it does not help our children to say just be and say whatever you want and there's never going to be pushback because it is our job as parents to help nurture our children, help them to be thoughtful about how they interact with the world, how to be respectful. Um, so I think it's important for parents to remember that if 
and when you are thinking about discipline, that the the punishment has to fit the crime. If your child does need some sort of disciplinary measure, it has to match. So you want to be very careful to not over over punish and lay in too heavy because again if the punishment doesn't fit the crime the kid's like wow i am a below it Mm. right Mm. versus helping to sit down with a kid and for children a lot of their behavior is about being dysregulated and especially when they're little that they're acting out when they are upset they are more likely to hit or do things that are not okay to do when they are dysregulated. So if a parent can think, okay, it's not just about saying, well, Tommy, you're, you, we don't hit, stop hitting. You know not to hit, go in timeout. Well, di- is this the first time Tommy's ever heard not to hit? Mm. Probably not. Most of the time, children are acting out not because they didn't know that they shouldn't hit. They get dysregulated and then they strike, right? So it is up to a parent to figure out. So then, okay, Tommy knows not to hit. So what is making him hit? That is something that has to be solved. So first, I got to calm my kid down because there's no teaching that's going to happen if my kid is upset. If they're upset, their brain is offline and you cannot help them. You can't mold them. You can't reason with them, right? So first of all, we got to calm our child down. And that usually means coming close to them. But a lot of times when we're upset with our children, maybe they acted out. We want to do what? Push them away. Mm. So again, we come back to the whole parenting is about staying calm. So sometimes the parent does have to take a beat. They got to go lock themselves in the bathroom to calm down. I got to calm down because I can't help my kid. If I'm not calm, I got no calm to give them. And I know they're supposed to be calm. So a lot of times it's, Hey, you know, not to hit, but you hit what happened right there. And then a kid may say, well, I just got so upset. And I kept telling my brother to stop and he wasn't stopping and he just kept coming. And I just, I kept, and I hit him. So then this is where we go back to saying, okay, yeah, I can see why you would be frustrated. You got so angry and desperate. So you hit. Mm. So what strategy, what can we do next time you get so angry? I think you need to come to mommy if you're getting really angry because we don't want to hit the next time you hit, unfortunately, and then you can, if there's not a pre-established discipline, next time you hit, there's going to be no bluey, no cartoon. (laughs) Okay. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So there is going to be some kind of repercussion, but Mm. first we have to figure out why is our kid behaving in this way It's interesting. I have a teenager and teens get such a bad rap, right? They're so spicy. They're little moods. Oh my gosh. (laughs) It's very interesting. (laughs) But if a parent can step back, step back and say, okay, their tone is sassy. Yeah. There's a part of me that wants a parent like my parents did and say, that's disrespectful. Change your tone. That is not going to be dealt with here. Right. And you shut your kid down. But I know, okay, my kid's acting, she's acting a little zesty. I bet something's off. So rather than like, I, this is hard too. Does my kid need me to come closer? Does she need me to back up? Because mm-hmm. sometimes we need to give our kids space so they can calm down. And sometimes they need our presence. So then rather than yelling at my kid because she had a sassy tone, I'm curious what happened. And usually I'll say, hey, you know, little spicy with me something on your mind and it a lot of times has nothing to do with me but I could make Mm -hmm. it about me and now we can power struggle about how my kid's not supposed to sass but really it wasn't about me it was because so-and-so left her out and her friends ignored her and she had to sit at lunch alone or whatever right and she's coming to me with all of her behavior she's just behaving And that's supposed to be our clue as parents. Our kids need something. 
So a lot of times it is about meeting our children's needs. That doesn't mean that we're going to give them everything they want. That doesn't mean that they're allowed to curse at us or to hit, Mm -hmm. or there's a whole number of behaviors. They're not allowed, but feelings, they're all allowed. And if we can care for the feelings, a lot of times the behavior shifts. And if your child is coming to you, actually telling you what happened at school or what went wrong or what's going on, I think you're doing something right, right? And that's the thing I want the most is just open communication with my kid when they grow up or hopefully kids someday too. Mm-hmm. Um, I I could have you on for so much longer. There's so many other things we can dive into. I'm very respectful. I know you got to go. Um, but I want you to pub your Instagram again. I want you to pub your website, how people can contact you, work with you, follow you, all that stuff. Sure. Well, you can find me on Instagram is probably where I'm the most active, emily.sanders.therapy. I'm on threads. You can find my threads account through Instagram as well. I'm on Facebook. I think it's the same Emily Sanders therapy, something like that. Of course, mm-hmm. I have a website. Um, I do practice in California. So to work with me, uh, you do need to be a California resident. That's how our state tries to make sure everybody's getting treated ethically. Um, So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, So if anyone's interested in working with me, of course, they're welcome to shoot me an email or whatnot. Um, That's awesome. You're great. Mm -hmm. I expected nothing less. You were awesome. (laughs) Thanks, Ryan. I know, like I threw a lot. Of, I I'm vulnerable. I'm honest in these conversations, but I know damn well those people listen to this are like, oh, I know exactly what he's talking about. I've been there too. And how do I resolve this? So you've given just the information that you give is life altering. Um, it is relationship altering. It could change people's relationships with their parents, their spouses, their kids, all that stuff. And what more could you want, right? So I'm just super appreciative of all the tip and tips and advice and information you gave on this episode and you're welcome back anytime oh thank you thanks so much for having me ryan i appreciate it anytime thank you very much